Welcome back to Atlanta Diaries. I'm your host Enma Popley. Thank you for joining me. In Atlanta Diaries, we celebrate unique and inspiring stories of breakthrough women to help future generations create their own. If you want to know more about Atlanta or listen to more episodes, you can visit my website www.enmapopley.com. You can also share feedback or suggestions there. It has been quite a run and I've thoroughly enjoyed having such wonderful conversations with some amazing inspiring women and more than that sharing these conversations with all of you. I want to take some time off to be with the three men in my family and I'm therefore taking a short break. But I will be back with another slate of amazing women starting August 4th. So do save that date. Meanwhile, I would not want you to lose your habit of tuning in every week to Atlanta Diaries. I've therefore selected a few hidden gems from my earlier conversation and I'm resharing them with you so that you stay inspired. See you on August 4th and happy listening. And thank you very much for your support in helping build this amazing Atlanta Diaries community. My guest today is Jenny Dearborn, recognized as one of the 50 most powerful women in tech for five consecutive years. Jenny is a thought leader in HR, the future of work. and data analytics after completing her 26 year stint in corporate america jenny founded actionable analytics group which is an advisory firm that supports human capital management and education startups from seed to ipo a champion of equality diversity and community involvement jenny has been recognized with honors including the stevi award for female business executive of the year and the athena leadership award Jenny is on a mission to make the world a more fair and equitable place. I had the most candid conversation where Jenny shared with me how she navigated a journey from a high school teacher to a C-suite executive and board member to influence this change. Without further ado, let's listen to Jenny's inspiring story. Hi Jenny, welcome to the show. Thank you. Excited to be here. And I'm so excited to share your journey with my listeners. and i'd love to start with the first question given that i am myself and from the learning and development background what led you to the path of learning and development yeah i think i was uh, drawn to education as an industry because i had not a great education experience as a kid k through 12 and so i was very motivated to help other high school kids that were in a same situation so i initially was a high school english public speaking and drama teacher so i went to stanford for a masters of education and a teaching credential and i was a teacher a few years and then i pivoted to corporate education from there so what kind of challenges are we talking about jenny yeah so i was still am have a lot of learning disabilities but when i was in high school those were undiagnosed so i was undiagnosed dyslexic ADHD and OCD so it wasn't until i was diagnosed in my first year of college that i learned uh, coping mechanisms and strategies to work through the challenges of my disabilities and i wanted to go into education to ensure that what happened to me did not happen to other similarly bright but misunderstood kids. Wow. Jenny, this is disappointing and interesting at the same time and I'd love to explore on you know when you actually got to know about this, what sort of emotions did you go through? Like was it anger, was it disappointment, uh, was it wonder that living in a developed country, how is it that nobody was able to figure it out till that far? Well, I mean I am in my mid 50s so this was a while ago we have a developed country but it was still pretty primitive i think in the 80s at the time the school district where i was attending had a policy of social promotion so promotion from one grade to the next not based on academics but based on what was good socially and emotionally for the child so that's why i was moved from grade to grade because i was articulate and well spoken and clearly intelligent but couldn't read or write so by the time they realized that i 
you know, couldn't read, it was kind of too late because I was already in middle school. And so I was put in uh, special education classes in middle school and high school. And there was, those were small classes with kids with cerebral palsy and full range of physical disabilities, blind and deaf. And, you know, I think I was the only kid with a learning disability in the classroom. And it was tough. I mean, your first questions, you know, what were the emotions that went through? I I had a very happy childhood. I had no idea that I was being mistreated or discriminated against. You internalize it when you're called stupid and retarded and, you know, some really harsh words. You, as a kid, you accept it. You know, you don't have the strength to push back. I didn't have the strength to push back and say, I believe in myself and you institution, you are wrong. And you, you move on and you climb trees. And I lived in my imagination and I was generally a happy kid. And it wasn't until I was diagnosed in my first year at American River Community College, I then became angry. It was at that moment that I realized all of the years were wasted. And that I was mistreated and misdiagnosed and treated in a way that was convenient for the school, but not in the best interests of me as a learner. Yeah, I can totally sense that. And it makes me angry too, I'll be honest. Jenny, have you gone back to the school? No, I haven't. What I became motivated to do, you know, I was an English major and then I decided to be a high school English teacher. And I was very focused as a teacher on kids with different learning abilities, but I only lasted two years and then I pivoted to uh, corporate education. What triggered that pivot? I had very grand ideas of saving the world and saving future learners and the reality of working in a school is, you know, you have to figure out how to teach you know, Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet five times a day, every day. Well, I love Shakespeare, but I don't want to teach the same books all day, every day for the rest of my career. And all of a sudden it hit me how repetitious it was. And that was not something I was, I didn't occur to me. And so I I pivoted to corporate education and it was relatively smooth transition from standing up in front of teaching 18-year-olds to, you know, 25-year-olds at Hewlett-Packard. That's really interesting, Jenny. Why don't you share with us how you thought through your career then from Hewlett-Packard to now? It really played out very organically. I would describe my career from being a high school teacher to a C-suite executive to a boardroom director as really following my curiosity and following my interests. I taught high school for only about two years, and then I was curious to try working in a corporate setting, so I became a classroom instructor at Hewlett-Packard. I worked my way up at HP and then Sun Microsystems, Docent, SuccessFactors, and SAP through positions of increasing responsibility and scope in both HR as a practitioner and in sales, selling HR services to the GNA buying center. I know you've helped a lot of what you call diamonds in the rough. So what kind of advice would you give them to help them to pursue their journeys? Do a lot of research. Know your stuff. When you are an expert in something, speak up and use your voice. You have to be your own best advocate and you can't wait for other people to open the door for you. That's certainly nice when it happens, but if you wait for that, you might be waiting past when you actually deserve to be in that room or in that job. And so you have to kind of make your own luck. You know, luck comes to the prepared. My mom always told me that. And so it's knowing your stuff and being in the right room and doing favors for the right people so that when the time comes, they'll return a favor to you. I always try and give first before I ask so that in a way, 
when it's time to ask, you know, you can say like, I mean, you, you don't literally say like, dude, you owe me, but you will ingratiate yourself to people to return the favor. There was a time when you were traveling 20 countries, right? So how did you navigate so many different things like navigate cultures, navigate your, you know, work and your personal life? Somewhere in between, you said you also had your kids, you did your MBA. So talk to me about the balancing act. Well, choose your partner well. So my husband and I have been married for 31 years. We got married just a few weeks after the day we graduated from college. He's the CEO of his own company, but he his job is local, right? You know, he rides his bike to work and back and never travels. And I travel 50% of the time. So you have to have a balance, right? So that's sort of foundational. He worked at a small company. I worked at a big company. I work in tech. He doesn't work in tech. So that balance was good for our family. And I just have to show up as my authentic self. I mean, I'm six feet tall. I'm a giant human being, right? And I've been told that, like, you know, when I would have performance review at the end of the year, people would be like, try to be smaller. I'm like, what? I don't even know what to do with that. Like, I can't physically be a smaller person. You know, try to not be such a big person in the room. Did you actually hear those comments? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, I heard those words. And after a while, I'm like, okay, well, what does that really mean? Like somebody told me once when I was traveling a lot, I'm too American. I don't know what that means. You know, so, you know, you try and sort of peel away these weird feedback and you say, what are people actually trying to say to me? And so my takeaway was to listen more, to be more humble, to be my authentic self, but also have a great deal of empathy for every culture that I go to, try to learn about the culture before I go, try to speak a few words of the language, be very open to the food. I would always try and listen to an audio book about the history of this country before I went so that I could engage because I love, love, love history and have conversations about that. And to just be really, really respectful of where every customer is coming from. Any anecdotes come to your mind? Like I read that when you went to, I think, Middle East, you wore a burqa. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So when I was in the Middle East, I think I was in Riyadh and my local country contact gave me the burqa while I was on the plane and said I needed to put it on before I got off the plane. And I was going directly from the plane, from the airport to a meeting. So I already had on a, a work suit and heels. Even though I'm six feet tall, I, I wear heels because they're what's comfortable for me. So anyway, the burqa wasn't long enough. And so what showed underneath the burqa was the bottom half of my calf and my ankle and my high heel shoes. And Whoa. <laughs> so I was wearing a burqa and a scarf and sunglasses and like very little of my face showing. And I got pulled into a room at the airport and, a, you know, devices taken away from me and asked questions, was treated very respectfully. But my, my takeaway was don't show your ankles. <laughs> that's not okay. No one literally said that to me, but I know that's why I was stopped and I should have put that together before I got off the plane. Jenny, let's uh, shift gears a little bit and love to talk about your book, Data Driven. So what inspired you to write that book and what inspired you to get into authoring? Yeah. So I have two books. Data Driven is uh, published in 2015 and The Data Driven Leader, which is 2017. And they're both stories of experiences that I had at success factors and sap like what was the prior state of what was happening at work what did we do to implement change what were the results and and what did we learn from it so problem solution results learning that whole journey was basically the story for each of the books data driven is how performance analytics deliver extraordinary sales results how do we understand what are the success metrics of the best sales reps and 
ensure that all sales reps can be successful. So that project became book one. And then taking those algorithms and applying them to the challenge of leadership became book two. Both were work projects that I talked about at conferences. I did a keynote at some conference and people would say, how did you learn to do that? Or what did you read to learn how to, to do those algorithms you were talking about? And I said, well, I didn't, I, we just made it up. I mean, I had tons in, uh, of help, amazing, you know, Sanchita Sir, who is an amazing support and, you know, lots of people in my team and, and vendors and partners supported us on this journey. And I just had enough conference participants come up to me afterwards and say, could you write that down so that we could learn it too? And I was like, it didn't even occur to me to write a book, but I just got enough encouragement from audience participants every time I gave the presentation. And what's exciting is both books are still used as college textbooks. That's just so interesting, imparting knowledge and learning and development through a different tool. Jenny, I want to backtrack a little bit. You mentioned that earlier you felt a lot like an underdog. So when did you become aspirational from this person who was angry and written off? You were talked about as one of the top 50 leaders in the tech industry. How did you change your perspective? And how did you tell yourself that you can do all this and more? There must have been a journey you sort of navigated to make that happen. I don't know that I told myself I could do that. I was very surprised when I got the award of the 50 Most Powerful Women in Technology. It was not anything I applied for, and I don't know how it... I think somebody at SAP must have applied for it for me. I'm not sure, honestly. My perspective is, how do I help the most people? What platform do I need to leverage so that I can have a greater scope to reach more people to be of service? It's like when I would ever interview for a a job and someone says, why do you want this job? And you don't say, "Uh, well, it's at a higher level, so I'm going to get more money. (laughs) You uh, You know, I'm going from a director to a VP or something like that. The right answer, it's about the scope, which allows you to have greater influence so you can get more done, so that you can be of greater service to more people. If you have a small team, you're helping the 10 people that report to you. If you have a larger team, you have more influence and you can be of service and help to more people and a greater portion of the company or greater scope and influence on the corporate strategy. So my ambition was always, how do I increase my scope so that I can be of greater help and support and service? My journey was never, I want to have this level of success so that I can get these awards or financial benefit or anything like that. It's it's always about, how do I help more people? Which I think ultimately goes back to, why did I leave being a high school teacher. I mean, each year I would have 30 to 40 kids in a classroom and I would have five periods a day that I was teaching. So that's what, I don't know the math. It's like 160 kids a year. So over a career of 30 years, how many people are you going to reach? Those are really important humans at a really important time. But also I was too impatient. I had a greater sense of urgency And so that was always my motivation, touching more people, helping more people, having more influence. And the the Lucite trophies just came along the way. I wasn't anything I was seeking. Oh, absolutely. That was more metaphorical. Jenny, tell me, what do you think we can do to be the voice to help others then navigate these challenges? You've spoken a lot about vulnerability in the various interviews. So... How comfortable did you feel to talk to your teams about your challenges? You know, I think we have to be careful about the advice that we give. Show up, be your authentic self, things like that. I think people need to be cautious about that. And that that it almost comes from a position of privilege to say, be yourself, show up because that could backfire on somebody. And you need to be thoughtful about understanding your circumstances and the culture in which you operate and whether or not that makes sense. So I did not share 
maybe that wasn't the right answer, but I did not share with my company, with my teams that I had learning disabilities and cognitive disabilities, and that I'm considered neurodiverse and that I'm on the autism spectrum. I didn't share that for 20 years of my professional life. I was terrified if anybody found out. And I had to work twice as hard to read through all the documents and it took so much more. And I think that if I had in the nineties and early two thousands, if I had shown up at whatever company and said, I need a little bit more time, I need twice as much time to read these documents. I don't think that would have gone well, but when I was at a certain high enough level, you know, I worked for SAP and SAP had one of its significant pillars of the diversity agenda was neurodiversity and and hiring 1% of the workforce that was on the autism spectrum. And I give a lot of credit to Anka Wittenberg, who was the chief diversity and inclusion officer at the time for a very progressive agenda. And because of that corporate statement, I felt comfortable raising my hand and saying, you know, I was already an executive vice president. I felt comfortable saying, yeah, and and I'm neurodiverse. My God, the outpouring of people writing me notes saying, thank you for saying this. Thank you for making it safe. Because of you, I feel comfortable. I forwarded your article to my kid who's struggling or you made it okay for other people to say that they were in that situation too. But when I was early in my career, there was nobody, you know, in a corporate setting who was owning up to that. You know, there's Tom Cruise. Everybody knows Tom Cruise is dyslexic, but I'm like, yeah, I'm not Tom Cruise. So I'm not, I'm not an actor. And so it's, you know, like this is, this is a different world. Like him being a dyslexic role model didn't apply to helping me, giving me air cover when I was early in my career. And so I didn't feel comfortable. I do now because I've, I'm at a different place in my career. So I would say it's very important to show up and be your authentic self and to be vulnerable because it gives other people permission. At the same time, when you do that, look right and left and make sure that you're in a place that will respect you. If you choose to do that, make sure you're you're really comfortable and there's not going to be any backlash. I appreciate this, uh, Jenny. The wisdom of hindsight, how would you advise somebody, you know, who's comes to you saying, I have these challenges? What are the factors which have helped you to succeed thus far? Yeah, you have to put in double the effort. I mean, certainly K through 12 was, in hindsight, a complete waste of time for me, which was really a bummer, right? You know, you think about how much kids learn and grow in these years. And if I had a different experience, it would have propelled me much faster in my life. And anything that's in a traditional academic setting, you know, of like reading and writing and sitting still, those things still happen in a corporate environment. That's certainly challenging. But neurodiversity has been an incredible blessing when it comes to creativity and innovation and problem solving and seeing around corners and having a peripheral vision and a big picture thinking that I think a lot of my peers don't have and has allowed me to, you know, put disparate pieces together and see connections in a creative way that maybe others don't. So I think being differently abled has been a real blessing in in a corporate setting in those regards. So it really it's it's a mixed bag. Absolutely. You know, given that those 20 years must have been so hard when you said that you would be nervous or if you're worried that somebody gets to know, who then was your safe space where you could go and talk about it? Who helped you to then navigate this journey of 20 years? I mean, you put your head down and you get your work done. What's my safe space? Uh, My family with a disability, if it's not safe to talk about it, you just don't, you know, it's not like I let it all out with a therapist or something like that. I didn't, you just shove it down and you just power through. 
that's what I did. I mean, I talked about it a little bit with my family at home, but I just assumed that this was going to be something that I had to keep under wraps my whole life. It's not like it's bubbling under the surface all the time and you're waiting for it to burst through and you're waiting to be able to tell people about it. And uh, as much as you can, pretend it's not there. And so it was a real shock almost when I got to SAP and they said, oh, by the way, we're going to have this program about neurodiversity. I'm like, what's neurodiversity? I didn't know what that was. And they were like, oh yeah, it's for people on the autism spectrum. Like, wait, what? I was told never to say that word out loud. What do you mean you're embracing people with autism? You know, that, no, that's not something we talk about. And they're like, oh yeah, we're talking about it. And, all the, and it took me months of SAP normalizing this term and recruiting practices and all that stuff. And I, after I was like, maybe should I say something? It wasn't like it was, oh, thank God. Someone's letting me talk about something that I've been dying to talk about. No, I had, that was way deep buried. It took a while for me to feel comfortable. At first I was like, I mentioned it to one person and I waited for it to explode in like a very private meeting. And, and they were like, oh, that's great. I was like, wait a minute. That's great. What? (laughs) You know, it took, you know, and then I said it at a, like a staff meeting with like six people and I waited it for it to backfire on me and it didn't. And then I said it in an all hands of like a hundred people and I waited for it to, you know, for catastrophic blowback and it didn't happen. And then I said it in a company newsletter and nothing bad happened. And then I said it in a, an article and then all of a sudden, and then it was in the press and then I'm being invited to other countries to get on a stage and present awards representing neurodiversity. That was not anything I ever thought would happen. How it's positively received by people is nothing I could have ever anticipated. At some level, for no fault of yours, Jenny, you felt like it was a stigma? Yeah, it was a stigma, of course. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up being told I was retarded. I mean, how could in 20, 30 years that all of a sudden that's something that's celebrated? I mean, I just never fathomed that. Never in my wildest dreams would I imagine that we would be in this situation now. You know, I'm asked to speak at schools all the time and I tell my story, like discriminated against, told you're stupid, didn't realize that that was bad. It was just like, all right, I guess it's the way it is. And then when I'm diagnosed, then I become full of rage, anger. And I had this jet fuel backpack of anger. And I was like, I'm going to be the most successful person in the world because I'm going to prove everybody that I went to high school. I'm going to prove them wrong, those sons of bitches. And I'm going to grind my success into their their faces. And I was fueled with all this anger. And then I, after 10 years of striving, 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 I'm just like, what am I doing? This is ridiculous. This is not making me happy. This is not a way to live a life. I'm just going to get back to just being a regular old person, (laughs) trying to do good in the world. And then with time, something that was the worst thing in your life becomes something that's celebrated. And I just never would have anticipated that journey. And so that's what I tell kids, you know, I'm, you know, I'm asked to be keynote speakers at high school graduations and things like that. And all I say is, if you've had a crap K through 12, all I can tell you is it gets a whole lot better from here. And you got to stick around and you got to put in the work because those good results are coming. Those awards and trophies and Lucite trophies, they're coming. You just don't know it now. And you can't anticipate right now that all the crap that you've been through, you know, is actually going to pay off and be an incredibly valuable experiences that will fuel you and fuel your success moving forward. Thank you for sharing this, Jenny. Jenny, if there's one thing, if you had to rewind your life and if you wish that school did it differently, will you be able to put a finger on that? Oh, wow. I wish that I had gone to a school that 
had diagnosed me early and had put me in classes to help me thrive as a neurodiverse kid. I mean, there's some amazing schools that have special programs for ADHD and dyslexic kids that are doing phenomenal work. And I love, love, love touring them and speaking with them. They're fantastic. And I just think instead of squishing your dyslexia and your ADHD into a little box, how do you go through school and just let it out and let it thrive? Um, That's what I wish I had differently. Did you ever hold your mom and dad? Did you hold it against them? Wow. This is a conversation with my therapist all the time. Um, yeah, absolutely. Went through lots of years of being super angry at my parents. But, you know, again, this conversation with my therapist, I'm number five out of six kids. We grew up without much money at all in a small, a little farm town. And my parents had their share of trauma and hardships when they were growing up. And my dad was orphaned. They did absolutely the best they could. And what we were not short of in our family was love and laughter and compassion. I absolutely knew I was loved and they did the best they could. And we had so much fun. Thank you for sharing this, Jenny. I'm sure this is going to help a lot of listeners. Jenny, on a lighter note, somewhere I saw where you painted this lovely canvas of superheroes. (laughs) (laughs) Talk to me about how did that become your um, theme? I like to say that I was into superheroes before it became cool. Everyone's into superheroes. I'm like, haha, yeah, but I've been doing it for 50 years. So I taught myself to read by reading comics, probably in fifth grade or something like that, you know, when most kids are reading in first grade. And then I love the art. I love the colors. You know, it's a beautiful art form, comic drawing. You know, and also what superheroes represent, fighting for the underdog, the humanity combined with justice, the clarity of good versus evil, all of these things really spoke to me. And then also my husband and I, 20 years ago, we moved into the house we have now, which is a dilapidated, falling into the ground, red tagged by the city, which means that it's like dangerous, this old Victorian house. And we couldn't afford any anything for the walls. And I love art. And I was like, I'm just going to do it myself. What's the worst can happen? And my husband was like, well, what do you love? I said, well, more than anything, I love superheroes. So he said, well, then do it. So I rode my skateboard downtown to the arts center. And then I put this eight foot by six foot canvas on my skateboard. And I walked to this canvas home because it was too big to get into a car. And I just hung up these white canvases all over my walls. And I just stared at them for a long time and like until it came to me. And so, yeah, so I started sketching my favorite scenes from comics. And then all of a sudden my house is full with so many superhero paintings. Now I've run out of wall space and I I can't give them away fast enough. Oh, that's beautiful. So is the house still full of the same painting? Oh my God. Yeah. It's it's bursting with super (laughs) giant, you know, but they're like the smallest one is five feet by seven feet. Oh, wow. So, but the kids must be loving it. I'm sure. Thank God I'm an empty nester. They're all gone now. So, um, adios. Yeah. But it was certainly something that they had to deal with when they were growing up is that I was constantly painting (laughs) superheroes. Before the end of the conversation, I want to touch a little bit upon your journey as a board member. When I started Atlanta Diaries and I did like a little research with women across the globe, some very interesting themes came out of that research. I read your favorite quote, Madeleine Albright's quote, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. And my uh, research also showed the same theme like women don't support other women. They also had questions like, how do we earn the seat at the table? How do we, you know, build presence? How do we build influence? So, you know, as a board member who's also experienced this journey and therefore got the rightful seat at the table, love to get your perspectives on how would you answer these questions? Yeah. I also like the quote, lift as you climb. And so it's easier to be in the front and push through the crowd when you know there's a group of people behind you, that you're doing it on behalf of somebody else. 
it gives me strength to have tough conversations and to push through adversity when I know I'm doing it to help other people. Because if I'm just doing for it for myself, I'd rather sit in a chair and watch TV. Like I'm really lazy. But if I know I'm doing it for somebody else, that gives me energy. And all of a sudden now I have the strength of a thousand people because I have to do it to help others. And so through my journey in the corporate world, each time I reached a new level and had a broader scope, once you sort of get a sense of what your job is at that level, then you realize, ah, in order for me to be really effective where I am now, I actually need to be higher because that's where the power and the influence is. And so when I got to the C-suite, that was when I realized it's actually not the CEO that has the final say, the ultimate authority. It's the board. It took me a while to understand. I think I came to really learn this at SAP when I made presentations to the board that that's where the decisions are being made. You know, so I think all of us should think about, you know, why is my boss doing that? The CHRO. Well, his boss is the CEO. Well, why is the CEO doing that? Well, you know, the CEO's boss is the board. And that strategy and that influence from the board is really where the buck stops. If I had known that sooner, I would have been a better C-suite executive because then I really understand the interplays of decision-making. And, and when I really learned that the most diverse boards diversity of thinking, diversity of perspective, diversity of background, race, gender, et cetera. They have the most diverse and successful C-suite, which then has the most diverse and successful executive team, which then has the most diverse and successful corporation. And so if you're at the bottom, you know, you're basically battling windmills. Your voice and your is going to get lost. It comes from the board down. And if I really want to influence change and make the world more fair and equitable and just, because we spend the majority of our lives and the best years of our lives and the best hours of our day at work, and we want work to be purposeful and have meaning and provide joy. And if that's the mission, really it starts at the board. When I had that realization, I was, ah, I need to pivot my efforts from being the best C-suite executive I ever could be to being the best board member I can be. And that's the journey that I'm on now. And I, I started that when I, when I realized all these connections. What is the one toolkit in your toolbox, Jenny, which has been there from then to now, which has made success possible for you? Maybe jumping in the deep end and figuring it out. Again, sort of circling back, is it confidence or is it naivete? What's the worst thing that could happen? Go try it. This was really inspiring and insightful, Jenny. Any parting thoughts for women leaders as they transition into larger roles? Be ambitious. If there's 10 things that you need to do a job, women will apply for that job when they've mastered eight of them and there's two left to go and men will apply for the job when they've mastered three of them and seven left to go. I would say go for it earlier. Go for it before you're an expert and learn on the job. Apply, put yourself out there. Just try, jump in. You might embarrass yourself and then you're going to lick your wounds and then you're going to go, ah, oh, damn it. That was stupid. What did I learn? How can I grow through this adversity? You know, it didn't kill me. It made me stronger. Yeah, you earn your seat at the table by taking chances. This is very interesting. You're the 12th person on the podcast, and I think at least six women have echoed the same sentiment. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of learning in this piece of wisdom. Thank you for sharing all your experiences and bringing your authentic self to the conversation. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. It was lovely chatting with you. Thank you very much for listening. All my guests have brought their most vulnerable selves on Atlanta Diaries. 
and even if a small segment of these conversations can help champion the journey of one person it's going to be really worth it i do have a request for you please share this podcast on your social media and with your family and friends our society is constantly evolving and atlanta diaries must too i really appreciate if you can leave your feedback in the form of a review or a rating these are impactful and rousing stories that need to be shared far and wide see you next time for another one on atlanta diaries